This transmission is the Boondocast. podcast of bundablog.com the home of whatever the podcast that strong am i with the force that's right yoda strong are we with the force and today is a very special episode of the Vundacast. here i am with the newly awoken danielle how are you newly awoken danielle the force is awoken me that's right. She's forced to awoken all over the land. I can't believe there's not a line of like Force Awakens alarm clocks mm. that are called like <laughs> Awaken with the Force. I'm sure. And they put like a little like like something that like vibrates on like your arm and it like just slowly like tingles you awake or something. I'm covered in dogs right now, so I apologize oh if I sound a little strange. Yeah, we're hanging out with these dogs because it turns out that Darth Vader told me that um Actually, Duke told me. No, wait, hold on. This isn't. How do I make this soundboard clip make sense? I don't know. Just say it, Darth Vader. I am your father. That's right, Duke. I am your father. That's my favorite. God damn it! Am I, am I, am I killing him clips. with the sound? Hey. Yeah. The the story of this podcast. I gotta make sense. Of is Solo a Star Wars story? Yes. Okay, and we would like to let everyone know. Every nanny know. Every nanny know. Every nanny know. Steven's super ready to podcast right now. Dad. Because I love Chewbacca. And all these assholes online wanted to take Chewbacca's money away this weekend and pissed us off. All weekend I was fuming with Sith-like rage. Okay, I think that's, that's enough of the general soundboard, yeah. but we do have a special guest this episode who might come in and out. He's a friend of mine from a little planet from Kashyyyk. You might have known him. His name is Chu Bakastein. He doesn't. He's he doesn't, Jewish. He doesn't let people know that, but he's, he's a member of the tribe. He's been in Hollywood a while. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm not being anti-Semitic, I'm sorry, Chewbacca. I'm just saying. Jewish. Everyone changes their name to something less Jewishy in Hollywood. That's yeah. what people do. That's what Chewie did. <laughs> so, we saw Solo, A Star Wars Story. We have seen Jewish. it twice. And we've seen it um, twice only because we spent our weekend in the bosom of the Disney Star Wars heart. Yes. Okay, in Orlando. And we got exclusive information about Star Wars at Galaxy's Edge. It has been... Pardon my yawn. It has been, like, almost two years since we've been to Disney. We took a long break, you know, to get married. There used and... to be annual pass holders. There's some yes. early episodes where you could hear of our adventures in the parks. Mm-hmm. We actually did some podcasts in the parks and stuff. Um, so we took a break to get One married. One five-minute podcast. And, yeah, shut <laughs> up. Took a break to well, get married and to do other stuff. And so... We decided that we were going to go to Galactic Nights. Um, what's funny is, I was like, you know, we need a break. And we need to be immersed in some Star Wars. So let's go to Galactic Nights. It's not a big deal. And it was the best weekend to do it for and us. This, but what's funny is, this is before we made an even more ridiculous and, impo- and insane decision to... And well, it's, this is the first time you're hearing of this, Vundicast listeners... We are going to Star Wars Celebration 2019 in Chicago, Illinois, at the McCormick Place. <laughs> You're looking for like excited Chewbacca. 
We're going. We have gotten our plane tickets. Yes. We are awaiting the the opening of ticket sales in a couple days. June fifth. Yep. June fifth or June first. June fifth. Oh my Plan god. For that. June fifth. Um, so we are planning to be there in Chicago for six days and enjoy the glory and the rapture that will come there. From being around thousands of Star Wars fans. It will be the halfway point to episode nine. Mm-hmm. Like almost exactly the halfway point to episode nine from where we are right now in the Star Wars universe. Yeah, hopefully we will get Timeline a trailer. Of fans. Um, we should get episode nine trailer. There's so many... Right now, um, Star Wars, like, pots being, like, cooked up right now. There's so much stuff so to see. So they, yeah. they could show a lot. Like, I think well, they, they could have episodes of Star Wars Resistance for us to watch. Possibly. They could have um, perhaps maybe an episode of John Favreau's new show mm-hmm. for us to watch. They might have news on what Weiss and Benioff from Game of Thrones... Are doing in Star Warsville, even though by then they should be still be in production on Game also, of Thrones. Also, next year is uh, also the end um, in I believe summer and then fall. Disneyland and Disney World, respectively, are opening their Star Wars Galaxy Edge. Edge theme parks. And we just went crazy because this weekend at Galactic Nights, they they told us all the name. Yes. Of what the land would be. Yes. And we just saw Solo now for the second time. And they named, they put the name in the movie before they told us. Before they told us. L3 took, it could, it's the only one that could get um, Lando to Black Spire. And that's Black Spire Outpost where Black we Spire will is, visit. Where, yes, which oh will be God. the name, Black Spire Outpost will be the name of this planet that we will be visiting at Galaxy's the, the Edge. The village, and then it's Bla- like Blatu or something like that. Batu. The planet. Batu. Batu is the planet. Black Spire. Uh, Black Outpost. Black Spire Outpost is the name of the village. And it, they, it's really we sat through a, uh, a like basically an hour long panel that they had in the Indiana Jones um, stunt show uh, stage mm-hmm. that was ho- that was uh, opened uh, by Warwick Davis who yes. is also in Solo a Star so Wars if you, story. If you, for, for the listeners who don't know what Gal- Galactic Knights is, you know. Star Wars at Disney has kind of taken several iterations. They had Star Wars weekends at one point during the maze where they would have something going on. Well, they had that weekend. for a long time. They, they had, had that, that for, for a like, very long like 15 time. 15 years or so. Then they basically decided once they bought Star Wars from Lucas, I mean from George Lucas, they kind of decided to phase those out and they started doing more specialty galactic Premium nights. Premium events you have to buy into directly. Um, buy, yeah, buy into to go... But this is all kind of a prequel to their their big goal, which is now to open this theme park, which will be a co- totally immersive mm-hmm. Star Wars land mm-hmm. experience. And it totally feels like when we're there at this event that is from like 6 p.m. to midnight mm-hmm. um, at the park, exclusive for the people that bought into this mm-hmm. extra event, um, one of the things they were selling with it that we bought into was like a meal package where we mm-hmm. each got five different of their meals to sample and they had such like a large variety yes. of like extra fancy food and you could just tell that this is all of like their research yeah for the park like what is selling well what do people like like how does this work effectively do you guys want to eat small I'm talking scale about when what's so interesting is that disney disney meal plans and packages for stuff like this they're not shoving hot dogs and hamburgers in your face this is you want to eat duck? You never eat duck. You're gonna eat duck. You're gonna mm-hmm. eat uh, crawfish. You're gonna do you, eat. Do you want to? Do you want a fancy glaze on yeah. your drumstick? Here it is. Yeah, like I'm talking. They really go all out for these little these little um, tastings. They do what's what's been very successful is for Disney is to do this kind of tapas style menu stuff. So they sell you snack. They they're usually like eight dollars a piece, um, and then they dr- and they have specialty drinks. And they sell it, and it really works for them because people love the fact that for like eight, because because a, a normal Disney meal, a sit down meal at a restaurant mm-hmm. where you can get the fancier Disney food is very expensive. Very very expensive. Uh, for two people, it's a hundred dollars easy. Um, yeah, and, I would I would say 
For two people who aren't like trying to be frugal, yeah, it'll turn into a hundred dollars easy. easy. You yeah. and me, we would keep it to like sixty and seventy because yeah. you know we'd watch and but that's share we don't drink and whatever. Alcohol. Yeah, yeah. Like we don't go yeah. hard like that. Yeah, yeah. But if you're buying alcoholic drinks, if you're doing all this kind of mm-hmm. stuff, a hundred dollars easy for just two people. Mm-hmm. Imagine a family of four. The five. most we ever spent was when we went to Le Cellier and we did drink. Yes. And it, we had it got, forty-five dollars you know, steak. A hundred and fifty dollars. It was yeah. fifty dollars steak. Yeah. And it was the best freaking filet mignon. If you have a chance to go to Le Cellier and spend $150 on a meal, know that that's the best meal that you will probably ever have. Now we're the, like, snootiest. Now we're we're not, we are not rich. We just don't am, have children. Yo, I am, <laughs> I am 31 years old. I hope that I've at least been able to spend... And I've only been able to buy one, yeah, one one hundred and fifty dollar meal with fifty dollar steaks in my thirty one years of life. Exactly. If that's being snooty at thirty one years old, then I guess that I I don't want the in the upper elite one percent. I don't want the listener eating ramen out of like a bathtub right now for some reason. To hate us. To be like, but no, seriously. Yo, I just spent I just eat eleven dollar Chinese food like yeah, exactly. Um, so, no, yeah, so Galactic Nights, basically what it is, um, it's a, it's a special private event, you know, from, from set, from around, it starts, you start around 7 to midnight, where you, for five hours, everything is Star Wars centric, so they have, you know, photo ops, they have, with different sets from the movie, like, not the actual sets, but, like, replicas of the sets, mm-hmm. they have character photo ops, they have they brought food out, that are themed food, they brought out themed the famous, drinks, themed alcohol. They brought out the famous, um, what is known on the internet as the Smut Hut, where Kylo Ren and Rey touched through the Force. That was a great photo op, That yes. was a photo a op, lot and of had Kylo a long Ren line. And Rey, yes, a lot of Kylo Ren and Rey um, cosplayers. Oh, that's the other thing that's positive, that's great about these kind of separate events, is that people get to dress up in cosplay, which is something you're mm-hmm. not allowed to do on, normal on days. a normal day at the park you are allowed to dress up in cosplay when you go to these things so you see a lot of people mm-hmm. i saw this amazing couple that had made their baby stroller into an x-wing it was awesome complete with a little r2d2 on top all out of cardboard and prayer I'll put that on the podcast it, yeah i got pictures because i started uh doing like little mosaics i was very ca- i was very careful to but i told them i was like i want to take a picture of your stroller but i don't want to take a picture of your baby because that is weird so they, I was very careful to get the angle just right, mm-hmm. so I would not get a picture of the child. But just the manufacturing of an X-wing stroller. It, oh, it was beautiful. It was it so was dope. gorgeous. It was, it was amazing. And so, um, yeah, like people are. And what's just what's great about events like this, in any form or fashion, is being around people who are just genuinely excited about Star Wars. Like, we met a guy who would come over from Massachusetts his, yeah, this guy, for one night. This guy. This is five for, hours. With his, with his uh, like, four-year-old, yeah. five-year-old daughter, who you could tell loves Star Wars. Yes. Is dressed up like Chewbacca. Chewbacca. Mm-hmm. Is excited to she meet Captain, to meet Captain Phasma, Phasma. Yeah. who was a special photo op that was there. And mm-hmm. she looked awesome. So shiny. She did. She was very shiny. Oh, shiny. my God. So yeah. shiny. Um, and Ray was also a special photo op with Chewie. Kylo Ren, um, what's called BB-8. The, the Jawas came out and played, but no, yeah. but I'm talking about the exclusives. Yeah. BB-8's there, I think, quite is frequently. Yeah, because yeah, he's, he's installed. I'm pretty sure he's BB-8 there. is there, and stupid Danielle saw the stupid puppet. And I cried because I got really emotional mm-hmm. because I love BB-8 so much that the idea of this little puppet fucking droid. Keep it booping at you. Oh my god. I much. couldn't handle it. I was just like so no. emotional. Kylo Ren is kind of creepy to me. You would think, ooh, exciting, like, just to pretend it's Adam. But it's not, because they pre-record all his phrases, and they just keep, like, pressing different mm-hmm. random buttons, and it's scary, because yeah. he, like, stalks around and really they, violently. And, and they like to let him pop up on you. Like, he's... Because the way Kylo in Disney Parks is, like... Pre-Force te- Awakens. Pre- is Force Awakens Kylo. So he's scary, and he's stalkery, mm-hmm. and he's, like... They're milking as yeah. much Vader oh, out totally. of him as they can until but they make him a perfect prince. here's what's interesting interesting is that the okay at the end of galactic nights they do a beautiful mm-hmm. kind of um uh firework show, firework show slash projection clip screen. show yeah. and they had they did not have uh, I, I don't we didn't watch the whole thing because eh, but like i want you don't want to get stuck in the giant crowd leaving but you can exactly sometimes. like we're we're old cranky people we hate getting stuck in the crowds but people recorded it and i did see some of it 
Kylo has been removed from the villain lineup, and Ooh. they had, instead of having him with the mask on, they had the sequence in The Last Jedi, throne when he and him. Rey fought in the throne room, and then they had the moment where they're fighting over the lightsaber together. Uh, total Raylo moments. Total yeah. Raylo moments. So, Disney's getting, Disney's rearing up. And so, you know, Kylo... <laughs> Kylo's still in the they parks. They had Chewbacca stuff too. Yeah. Okay. Kylo in the parks is still kind of, you know, pre Force Awakens Kylo. He's still kind of scary Kylo. But the fact that they've included Rey, mm -hmm. and Rey as a character has been taught, that, you know, because you have to understand that these, these people, when they do the characters, they are only allowed to say certain things. Okay. They are not allowed to say anything. You know, untoward or anything of their own thing. They're a lot. They have to say certain kind of phrases and whatever. And the rays in the parks. When you ask her about Kylo Ren, she says, "I still think there's light in Kylo Ren." Whoa. Yeah. So, bitches. But what's it was just really nice to have a good time with a bunch of people who genuinely enjoy Star Wars, and especially coming out over Solo weekend, and now Solo's been out, and it's like the cockroaches have crawled out. From under the fucking log, the you know the light has shone. They've, they, they, they've been in power. They've been enriched. I mean, it's just you. I you know I forgot how. They had a leash. I think mm -hmm. I had a few yeah. months to forget how toxic they really were. Even though I know I'm surrounded by them all the time, but to just have them kind of come out in this mass ensemble of fucking just negativity, you really just get tired of it, man. And it's kind of like, you know, Solo came out and they are just ready to go again. They're just. But it was nice to be among people who were not like that, who genuinely love the movies, who genuinely love and everybody George Lucas that we interacted with Lucas there, Hill. everyone that we interacted with at the parks, and that was just hanging out. Everybody seemed to be in positive, friendly, mm -hmm. non-combative, mm -hmm. non-aggressive, like just pure Star just Wars joy to have a good time. enjoyment. Yeah, exactly. Like. That is worth it was nice. more. We it also rode really nice. the Star Tours ride. Yes. And we saw the new crate scene, which we've never seen oh, before, that which was is really super cool. dope. Yeah, it was awesome. And then we also had the special experience since since it was a limited event um, that we got into a Star Tours ride just by myself, just me. It was a limited and Danny, event, and there had been so much rain that we think that, that chased that a lot scared of people, people away. away. Yeah. Because there had been... Because, you know, we've kind of had uh, some tropical disturbances. We had a tropical storm, like, coming yeah. through, basically, yeah. that weekend. Yeah, and, and it caused a lot... It's been... Basically, it's been raining in Florida for two straight weeks. Yeah. Um, so, that scared a lot of people away. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we rode the Star Tours ride. All we by ourselves. We were the Rebel Spy. I should have recorded it as a Bundacast episode. Wish. yeah. Because we could have just... Because we just talked shit the whole time. It was yeah, amazing. It, it, it was, was so, so much, much fun. fun. Whoa, I highly recommend if you have the ch chance to be alone at Disney and do everything by yourself, do it, rich people. <laughs> but um, the, the crate, yeah, the crate sequence in Star Tours was really impressive. It looks so amazing. Oh, and then another fun thing they did was they did the rock and roller coaster oh, yeah. as Star Wars themed. So the way they did Star Wars theme was they turned off all the lights in the ride. And they set up projections. And they set up little projections of like the rebel symbol and the and the and the, and the Falcon. Falcon and stuff. And then they played Star Wars Blasted music. Star Wars music. And so what was great about that experience is I had another woman, we got a she she said and I, and in my head I was thinking about that she said let's just did they make the ride faster? It, it felt, felt faster. faster. And I said to her, yeah, it did feel it's faster. I don't know if it was yeah, it was the music because normally if you've been on the rock and roller coaster at Disney World um, Hollywood Studios, it's Aerosmith music. So it's really fun and kind of like, and then there's like you're a, cruising. and there's a, yeah, you feel like you're cruising, but with the John Williams music over it, mm -hmm. with the Star Wars music, it felt so urgent. Mm -hmm. It felt so like, we're really, like, it felt what it feels like to be on the Millennium Falcon, traveling through hyperspace, mm -hmm. getting through the Kessel Run. Which, like, it felt mm -hmm. intense and it was really fun. Which makes me so excited about. Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, because I remember when I was a little kid going to Disney, and I'd go to Space Mountain, and you'd just look up at Space Mountain at that star field mm -hmm. with, like, the giant asteroid zooming mm -hmm. by, and it looked so good then, yeah. but you could still see some of the seams, you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But it was enough that you just could suspend disbelief that you're really looking into space, and to know that 
they're planning and have spent like three, four years figuring it out and they have 7,000 people organizing it and construction people working 24-7 yes, yes. and are bringing in people from all over the world. They are building full-sized at at These are the scale. things that we learned at the at the little, um, the half the half an hour to an hour um, panel. Yeah, they're building full-size They have to get Chinese people to build at them. At at they, well, they, no, what was, what was very interesting that we learned about, about what they're doing is because they don't want construction to stop, they basically have construction going 24-7 on different continents. And so they have different people in different countries making stuff, working on stuff. And I'm guessing they're all shipping it here and constructing and putting it together here like a puzzle. Because they, they obviously there's so much work involved in mm -hmm. making this that they cannot wait to have a crew that's just here and nine to five, you know, blah 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 blah. So yeah, yeah, you you can't wait to finish an ad at on site. Yeah, and also at the same time build the building around it. Exactly, at the same and all the plumbing time, you know and all I mean? the yeah, things yeah. that you need and all the. So what they're doing is yeah, twenty four seven construction. <laughs> Shush. Oh wait, hold on. Is there a commercial? Hi. We're on express elevator to hell. Going down. Two. One. Mark. So what topics do we talk about on the Vundercast? We talk about whatever we like, but mostly we talk about pop culture. We talk about Star Wars. Mira, who's Snow White? She's supposed to be some kind of consultant. Apparently, she saw an alien once. <laughs> Whoopie fucking do. Movies we've seen. Don't lie. All we talk about is Watch aliens. Oh, yeah, right. All yeah, we right. talk about is aliens. All we talk about is bringing things back to Star Wars. <laughs> All we ever do is bring things back to 1997. Don't fuck around. Yeah, I guess he's right. He's selling his friends now. Your face. Stop selling us out, Steven. Stop telling the truth. Danielle, you are not alone. Neither are you listeners. Mondays at radiate.fm with the Vundercast. Chewing. We're home. The Vundercast, which is on Mondays at Radiate. Hey, Danielle. Yes. Co host of the Vundercast, co workers. Mm -hmm. How many nipples does Kylo Ren have? Well, only two, but they are glorious. And to find out how glorious they are, tune in Mondays, radiate.fm. Ray love all year long till episode 9 comes out and beyond. Check it out. I am the ultimate badass. Yes, right. State of the right. badass art. <laughs> you do not want to fuck with me. Hey, Radiate listeners, you should tune in to us on TuneIn. The podcast is also there. You should stitch yourself to us on Stitcher because we're down. And if you want to Google Play with us, our podcast is also on Google Play. But me, I, I just use iTunes to subscribe to my own podcast. Great! That's just fucking great, man! Now what the fuck are we supposed to do? We're some real pretty shit now, man! You finished? Man. Game over, man. It's game over. What the fuck are we gonna do now? What are we gonna do? That's right. Chewbacca, we're back from our commercial break. Commercial? That's how Chewie Bacchans <laughs> say commercial. <laughs> right? Okay, yeah. That's what non Star Wars fans. He's a Chewie Bacchan, isn't he? He's a Chewie Bacchan. So no. we were talking Let about the win, got the we're talking about Galaxy's Edge. Thank you, Chewie. Yes, we were talking about Galaxy's Edge. Chewbacca is gonna meet freaking Hondo from Star Wars Rebels. Yeah, that was we a, learned that, and they're gonna have a storyline. There's a Hondo costume. Yeah. So he's gone from animated to the flesh. OMG. I want to tell you, and what's look the thing that people always marvel at is Disney's attention to detail. What I tell you, Zena told us Zena, a story. Zena, the Vunda dogs are here. Midnight hounds are here. Zena Duke, Morty Rusty, they're bothering us. We didn't introduce them. You're interrupting me to talk about but dogs. But we didn't introduce them, and Zena's won't stop licking me. Okay. 
Thank anyway, you. so the, the, the amazing attention to detail that Disney has in that they tracked down the original voice actor for, let me guess, you will never guess which character, for Nyenub. Nine Okay, Nine Nub. Is how they pronounce it, which... They pronounce for it For years, I've been saying Nyen Nub because... Nyen Nub. I'm Hispanic. I think it's Nyen Nub. I think it's because we're Hispanic. No, I've, I've heard a lot of people I'm say Nyen Nub. Yeah, but I've, 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 I noticed all the white people say Nyen Nub, and that... <laughs> so white people beat Star Wars, so... so the white people win? It's Nyen Nub. Whatever. Nyen Nub. Okay. Anyway, they tracked him down, the original voice actor in Kenya. He was a Kenyan a foreign exchange student who yes. was here... And they were like, oh, you want to make some money doing some voice acting? And, and he like, was sure. like, sure, I'll say gibberish. Yeah. And he did say gibberish. And he, and and he disappeared that, off his earth. He disappeared off the face of the earth. He went back to Kenya. And they found him 30 years later. Um, I think that he is a successful, he was doing some, he's some successful. He had some, like, some organization, organization or something. Organization, yeah, he's a successful organization. He has a successful, um, does work in Kenya. And they said, hey, would you like to come back and do the voice of Nineb again for our Galaxy's Edge theme park? And that is what they did. That's the kind of attention to detail Disney has put into the Star Wars universe. Disney, so to kind of segue, it just... It Disney pissed. knows that they have more money than God and that if they're going to do something, they're going to do it right. right exactly. And that it's worth it to do it right so that you can have the authenticity and so you also you have a story that fills up exactly. a couple minutes of park time exactly. for some guy to say in trivia to some fucking Disney is guest a, who came Disney is every all day. about the story. Disney is all about making that connection and the legends and, and the story and having that like, Warwick extra Davis mile. was there to talk about what he talked about at and the 40th anniversary Galaxy's panel. Galaxy's Edge exactly. You talked about his boy history mm-hmm. in Star Wars. It's like yes. beautiful. You see the kids in the audience get like excited, Super excited when they yeah. see him as a little kid in the 80s playing yeah. with Star Wars toys and on set dressed as an Ewok. Yes. That's the other great thing about going there is you see how these movies connect with kids and how much fun kids are having dressing up like these characters and playing them. And as a bunch it, of salty adults who are way too obsessed with this freaking thing we completely forget that it's the kids that really at the end of the day the kids are taking this legacy with yeah. them and it's about we dressing up and playing and having bitter fun assholes who have spent way too much time being into this yeah. but those kids but that's for me that's why when i watch star wars i try to watch it like a kid i do not try to sit there like I, of course yes when i'm on my when i'm on my tumblr and I'm being way too analytical as an English major. Mm-hmm. I totally an, an, you know, a, analyze the movies in a very detailed way, looking mm-hmm. for symbolism, looking for poetry in terms of like story writing. But at the same time, the reason why I'm doing that is because when I watch the movie for the first time, I am looking at the... the I'm just gazing at the magic mm-hmm. of the story. I'm letting the story take me away. I'm let I'm watching it as a kid. I'm I'm letting myself mm-hmm. when that music pumps up and the force theme plays and Luke looks at somebody and says, you know, you know, may the force be with you or whatever, like I get emotional about mm-hmm. it. I feel the magic of that moment. And so I think that seeing kids like today when we went to go see Solo for the second time we saw a little girl dressed two up. Little girls. Two little uh, girls. Two little sisters. One was dressed up as Solo. No, was one was dressed up as Jin Urso. Jin Urso, that's and right. And the I'm other sorry. one was dressed up dressed as Ray. As Ray. And when I tell with you, their, with their pair, their mom and dad were there. And, and it was it's, a, it's a fucking Wednesday night, okay? <laughs> a, 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 in a regular movie theater. And they're like six years there's old. There's no special event. They just wanted to come dressed up. And when I tell you that that matters to me so much to see that the stories have grown and evolved to include a whole new set of, of fandom. And for me... Like, a whole new me, generation exactly. of fandom. And for me, it's... Listen, when I first watched The Force Awakens, every time, and I still to this day, every time I see Rey pick up a, that lightsaber, I cry. Like, mm-hmm. I'm getting emotional just talking about it. I feel like... It's like that moment where it's like, it's our turn. It's our turn mm-hmm. 
to be a part of this story like this. Like, I love Leia, but Leia never got to pick up a lightsaber. Leia never got to be a Jedi. You know, Leia was an amazing character, and Carrie Fisher still means so much to me. To this day, I still cry when I think about Carrie mm. Fisher. But my point is, is that it's, like, amazing to see from Leia to the thread of these amazing new characters. And so, exactly, watching it from kids' perspectives... That's the great thing about going to events like this and watching these movies. And so I guess it's all connected into the bigger point that we watch Solo and the people kind of like... And, and I think this is a larger point because a lot of people are using Solo as an opportunity to shit on Star Wars as a whole right now. And it's really fucked up. You guys are being dicks. And so... I guess we're here to talk about Solo and talk about why people are being dicks. I don't know. Is that what you're... <laughs> you're still like... Probably, because Solo was awesome. My first note, whenever I see a, whenever I've watched any of these Disney Star Wars movies, my first reaction is I always leave the theater and I always... The first reaction I always think is, wow, that was a lot for a kid to digest. Yes. I always think about those movies like you do from like a childlike perspective. And then the second time I watch them, I realize they weren't that... Mm -hmm. dark like mm -hmm. they managed to walk this line mm -hmm. that they you know they show that there is this darkness there but they <laughs> move past it and have fun yeah and keep the story moving in a way that doesn't feel hopeless mm -hmm. and you know even though the universe in these star wars films mm -hmm. feels extremely hopeless xena i know I know. Zena and Morty were, were wrestling, is what you heard before. And now Zena is saying that... But you have to talk about these fuckboys on the internet, Daddy. Because they talk in so much shit, and they done piss you off so much. I know, Zena. Because they think, they think Solo's a failure, because it only made $83 million. But the fact is, is that that really doesn't even matter. Because we didn't finance the movie. Well, we're not the studio. We can get into the that I analysis, just... but I want to analyze... The film on its merits yeah, yeah, before exactly. we touch that. I, because I, I wasn't about to touch that. No, I know, but I'm saying, I'm just explaining yeah. our structure here. Yeah. Because what matters is the story of the film. What matters is if it was fun, if it did its intention, which its intention was to be a Star Wars movie in the summer. Mm -hmm. And it fucking was a Star Wars movie in the summer. My first reaction to it was that I felt like it It felt like different um, big budget movies all rolled in together. It was like a heist film mm -hmm. with a Saving Private Ryan sequence mm -hmm. with like a little Fast and Furious and that like you're constantly putting together this crew that has like unique abilities that are kind of, you know, a diverse... Um, it do, are we gonna like go through the plot and analyze it, or um, how do you want to? I mean, how do you want to tag this? I don't know. I I think if you just want to give a brief, I mean, check us out Mondays on Radiate.fm. Listen to me and Danielle talking about movie reviews and Star Wars and Kylo Ren's nipples. Oh my god! And the Love Shack theme song. Well, it's not a theme song, it's just a Love Shack song by the Dave and But we're going to talk about all those things sometimes on the Blimbycast. Mondays, Radiate.fm. Tweet us at Blimbycast or at Blimbyblog. We're back? We're back. Okay. No, I was just going to say that Solo is a movie for Disney that's kind of been plagued to, for, to be short and more concise about it. It's been plagued with a little bit of production woes. We um, spent more time hearing about the production woes of this movie than time spent them advertising and showing us the yes. movie. Every other Star Wars movie that Disney has released, mm -hmm. they've given us at least eight months Definitely. to market it and look at the footage and simmer about it and think about it. Definitely. All we've had for Solo, up until four months of its release, was just stories about how Lord Miller were fucking it up, mm -hmm. and Ron Howard had to come in and save it, and how great Ron Howard is at saving which, it. Which, which honestly, I, I, I do agree with some of the stuff that I've heard, and, and I, even before I heard anybody talking about it, 
I kind of wonder why they felt they needed to push it for this kind of May release. You know what I mean? I do wonder that. I, 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 I do. But on another level, I kind of understand why. And I think that there may be several things in factor. Some of it could just be business kind of experiments. Some of it could be, you know, um, they were you know, like a business experiment. Like I said, either trying to see if they could do both a summer and a fall movie um, or if how much Star Wars are people willing to take. Or it could be what, um, you know, a lot of us who feel, you know, for episode nine, they're kind of bringing everything to this, you know, conclusion for the main trilogy that the solo movie, and if you're watching it from this perspective of, um, you know, Han Solo and his son, Ben Solo. What context does Solo's life give you for Ben Solo? Exactly, for Ben Solo. So I think... Part of the reason why this was needed to be released now is because it absolutely has relevance to Ben Solo's journey and Ben Solo's story, and they needed to put it before episode 9 in order to have that. Mm -hmm. Though, really, they could have put it in the fall. They could have. And it would have been... But Disney, since they got Star Wars and moved it to Christmas... Okay, mm-hmm. there was a small portion of fans that felt Star Wars should be in the summer. Okay, and they had moved back because of the problems they had with Colin Trevorrow. They moved back episode nine from a mm-hmm. summer release to a fall release to a fall release, mm-hmm. and they I guess they decided to put make Solo a summer movie, and I think that that, as we saw with Disney at the parks is just an experiment for them yeah. to see how the market will bear it in the overall. And um, it's a small stakes experiment yeah. because you know that this movie has a cheaper cast than the other movies, mm-hmm. okay, from that perspective. Um, also, the your second lead of this movie is a fucking guy in a furry suit. Like... And this young, handsome actor, like, it's the Jane Silent Bob of and that's, and the that's, Star Wars universe. Yeah. It's, it's on a different scale. Like, the movie feels big and large, but it also feels like a different scale of movie than The Last Jedi. As I marked on Twitter, and then, uh, coincidentally, uh, Collider.com marked, um, yesterday, um... It is very much the Ant Man of the of uh, Star Wars universe. It's a fun, um, and this is kind of partially a review, my review, especially when seeing it two times. It's a fun movie that does service the story as a whole, but also is not something that it's kind of you know. It's a, it, I don't want to. I, I mean, I don't have a better term, but basically a throwaway. It's a fun throwaway movie. You can go, you can eat popcorn, you can enjoy it. Um, it's very, I think that in terms of world building, that's the most successful thing that it does um, because it is so detail oriented about Han's home world of Corellia, about, um, you know, the crime syndicates, uh, the, the Crimson Dawn, and the Hut Cartel, and these kind of moving parts within the empire okay. it's detailed so, on you know kind of like what different species are dealing with during the empire's sort of reign and the different characters and that for me is what kind of makes this not what kind of is what makes this movie super successful in terms of entertaining me because my favorite part of star is wars the is area. the detailed yeah. world building that exists where you can really delve into and I'm like, and honestly, then you're going to ask yourself, well, Danielle, didn't you say you weren't that big of a fan of the EU? How could you say that? And it's because, mm-hmm. because I guess maybe even as a young person, I knew that so much of the EU mm-hmm. meant spit and shit but, to the main trilogy. And it, mm-hmm. it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and, yeah. It's, and, and I was smart enough to know that yeah. even before. Or it's just a lot of extra sprinkles. Yeah. Like, it's just like. 
Whereas like, just now, just a bunch of extra, extra, exactly. extra stuff. Whereas right? now, because Lucasfilm and Disney have concentrated themselves on building everything around it's this, tighter complements tapestry. exactly. So everything I read, if I read. Lay of Alderaan, or I read Bloodline, or I read Lost Stars, or I read Last Shot by all these authors, I, or even the novelizations of the films, I'm getting details that matter to every part of this story. Mm. Nothing feels like a throwaway. Nothing feels like a Boba Fett novel that's a crime story, mm -hmm. that's a Darth Maul crime, nothing feels like a Maul book mm -hmm. where a cop that's going to die. You, oh my God. Are you like, this is what? funny. What? Huh? This what? Is humorous to me. What's humorous? Huh? What's humorous? Because you're basically right now on our podcast, yeah. the Lundacast, Mondays on Radiate. Yeah. You're basically shitting on EU fans. I'm so sorry. And... Steven, this guy over here. Yeah, you guys. He was on the Star Wars Legends podcast this weekend. I'm not shitting on EU fans. Where I hung out with EU fans. But I'm not shitting on the and fans. And defended Solo and the Disney Star Wars to people who are very, very contemptuous About. of Ray and Kathleen Kennedy okay. and Star Wars. But I don't think that's fair. I am not shitting on the fans. Currently. I am not shitting on the fans. Yeah, you're shitting, you're shitting on how Lucas... I'm shitting on... Let it, everything. I'm shitting you know, on for profit. The, I'm yeah. shitting on the EU. I'm shitting on the yeah. original Legends EU. Oh. Not all of it, and not all of it, but no. a lot of but, it. But on the lack of continuity, George, on the lack of a cohesive story. But unit. George Lucas purposefully mined those novels for yes. money to an abhorrent extent. Like the fact that there is like fifty of them or hundred of them. No, or there's. Many. I'm pretty sure there's hundreds, yeah, if not thousands and, of and, novels. And, and what it's I'm, not thousands. And I'm sorry, but as a, as a, as a, even as a Star Wars fan, for me, it just got the con, the it got so convoluted, yeah. and so little of it actually mattered to the central themes of the mm -hmm. story that was being told. This is why I appreciate, and you know what, you guys can call it. They can call it simplicity, stupidity, dumbing down. I'm sorry, I find it. A cohesiveness it's of th a thematic material because everything that I read in the comics and the movies that I watch and the TV shows that I watch, they all point to central thematic tenets that m enhance the main trilogy and any spin offs and the stories themselves. Mm -hmm. And I find myself mining it for content mm -hmm. when I read a phrase in a book that's so like, oh my god, this is like episode nine related, this is like this, that related. I love that. Mm -hmm. I think that it's like putting together a big fucking mm -hmm. puzzle. And I really appreciate that kind of attention to detail. So yes, I am not a fan of hundreds and hundreds of novels that literally fizzled off, you know, to one feckin' point. You guys love that stuff, and you feel that that's detailed. But to me, the problem is, thematically, that stuff didn't unify. Didn't feel as deep or as meaningful. As you. meaningful, because especially since... For even for George Lucas in his prequel trilogy, he threw it away. He didn't. He used some of it, but he didn't use all of it. No, he sprinkled it in. He sprinkled it in like here's a detail. Here's a detail. Here's, here's a detail. some chick that we pet in a comic. She's I feel. Got a I feel that Lucasfilm now is far more respectful of the EU material mm -hmm. because they use like real characters mm -hmm. from the other stories mm -hmm. and incorporate them into the thematic material. And oh, another thing too is that they have more cohesiveness. And how they release everything. Yes. So they never like make the misstep of like releasing the rogue, yeah. the, the first rogue squadron book, you know, five years, setting it five years after, exactly. you know, the last two books or whatever. They're like, paying so much attention to timeline. They're paying so much attention to where does this story fit within the larger story, within the narrative, within the prequels, within the new hope. Within, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I'm sorry, I just appreciate that. So Danielle went on. Uh, a huge rant on the fuckboys on uh, or on the situation this weekend on Twitter that I'd like to read through this thread. Oh, jeez. Because okay. the, it's a seven-part thread. Yes. Which is part of the reason, and you hashtag all sorts of stuff, which is part of the reason why we were like, somebody, Collider, mind you're, tweets for information you're telling, was our okay. supposition. You're telling this out of context, but yes, okay. Well, you spoke about it earlier, and then you moved on yes, to a I different did. area I before I could 
you know, continue with it. But I was, I was just, I was a jab. Mine was a jab. You wanted to jab? Yeah, I wanted to jab. But if you want to, if you want to But I think it's a very well-written thing. You're very sweet. Okay, go ahead. This is a thread. I don't want to make sounds with my mouth about this in a podcast, though I probably will anyway. Uh, so maybe this will satisfy me. It will not satisfy me. You know, sorry. It never satisfies me. Now, as you see Hemlock decrying the underperforming box office for this weekend, you're going to get the Gristle Rondas and other Star Wars fanboys, parentheses, and I use the term loosely, cackling and whooping that they have won, quote-unquote, something. It's all a trick for their view count. Don't listen. First off, Solo did better money than the last four years' worth of Memorial Days. It's made 101 million estimated. It made 103, and it isn't Monday yet. The movie is not a failure. When underperform is gleefully croaked from these people's mouths, they mean for a Star Wars movie. If Disney is going to start treating the Star Wars franchise like the MCU, I think everyone is going to have to adjust their expectations of what a Star Wars box office should look like. No one faults Ant Man for not making a billion plus dollars at the box office. Solo a Star Wars story is Lucasfilm's Ant Man. They knew this. That's why they let it compete with every other summer movie. They aren't running scared from you glorified septic tanks with keyboards. They aren't going to change tack for you. You're not going to single handedly destroy anything. And I, in my effort to be a Star Wars fan, am not going to let this weird culture of if it doesn't make a billion dollars, it's a flop, crap, keep pissing in my damned cornflakes and stop me from having fun at the movies. TLDR? Too Long Didn't Read. Oh, that's what that means? Yeah, Too Long Didn't Read. Oh, hey, I thought it was something about the Dark Knight. Oh my god, you're so old. (laughs) I thought that was about, like, drinking... I, I like hashtag solo a Star Wars story. Box office whiners are fuck monkeys. Have a great Memorial Day weekend. I still so. stand by what I said. And it's not that I don't acknowledge. You can find that at Cardigan Vixen. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it's Send not that I don't acknowledge. And, and, and talking about the box office, it's not that I don't acknowledge that, yes, solo should have made more money. And they did spend a ton of money on this movie. It really would be in a better position if it was going to make eight hundred million dollars. Well, the uh, the, uh, the reason I think it underperformed internationally was because unlike Rogue One, mm-hmm. it doesn't have that large of an international cast. Yeah. Like Rogue One did so well foreign because Donnie Yen, Yen and, and yeah. the other what's his name fuck, are huge stars mm-hmm. internationally in China. Yeah. Okay, and in in other yeah. in other. Properties. No, but I, I, I'm sorry. I do agree with you that I think part of the problem with Solo was that we did not have enough positive press flow. About it. We had controversy, 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 then like three months of, hey guys, Solo's coming out. We mm-hmm. We should have had eight. But the problem is, and I think that, and I, I do, I, this is something in which I agree with analysts and I agree with people talking about this, that... They couldn't do eight straight months bumps of Solo because they had to do The Last Jedi. Eight months of The Last Jedi. Of the Last Jedi. I agree. Yeah. So I think... And they only took a month off from I, Last I, Jedi I actually, to... Yes. And I actually do think, and I agree with people, that I think once a year is enough. Mm-hmm. And I think fall is the best mm-hmm. place for a Star Wars movie. I know people think summer, but I really don't agree. I think fall is the best place for a Star Wars movie. Also... Solo did not have the privilege of The Last Jedi and uh, that there wasn't Avengers Infinity War, Mm -hmm. you know, before it. Because Disney pulled so much attention to make sure Infinity War did its business that really Solo turned on the heavy, heavy flow Mm -hmm. marketing. Yeah. After Infinity War had cleared what it needed. Solo suffered. Solo suffered, but... My theory is that Disney's releasing five huge movies this summer. They're eating more of a shrinking market in the yeah, summer movies. Absolutely. And they're trying to beat the shit out of everyone else. Even if it hurts them a little now, mm-hmm. they know that it's a down payment and, for everything and sorry, else that matters I'm sorry, more. and listen to me. And listen to me. What is amazing to me, and, and we have to, I'm sorry, you have to acknowledge this. This is, has to be acknowledged. Yes. 
Solo is not going to make as much money as it should make to be profitable in terms of in-theater release. Yes, you know, um, this is kind of, this is a, a bad, they should have made way more money, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, the last four Memorial Days, they have released things and they have not done well and nobody's particularly done well during this Memorial Day. Yeah. And Solo has well, made more money in the last four years than any other movie that was released. Solo? And, and, st and Solo, even, even being a not successful Star Wars movie, but fucking hit a hundred million dollars. Yeah. It made a hundred and forty-eight million dollars this this fucking the weekend. The mummy would have taken a hundred million dollar opening. Exactly. It it made a hundred and sixty-eight million if you count the 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 international. It made a hundred and sixty-eight million dollars. Mm -hmm. Hundred seventy. The million mummy dollars. had just as much bad press about its production before it, and that couldn't get close to this. And okay, so, and that has had three films before it. That have made like a billion plus so dollars. So it's shocking to me. It's amazing to me that people. Okay, and that's why it's like this whole box office discussion. And you know, actually, someone had um interesting set of tweets, and um he liked it. It was actually the author of Last Shot, Daniel mm -hmm. Daniel Jose Older. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually reblogged something, and I think mm -hmm. that. I think that it's a relevant thing. Okay. Another another point while I was looking through all the weekends on Box Office Mojo, and I'm working mm -hmm. on, like, an analysis article. Yeah. Um, but X-Men Apocalypse, okay, mm -hmm. performed similarly to Solo and was considered, you know, less, less successful than X-Men Days of Future Past, mm -hmm. which had a... Uh, a same-sized three-day weekend mm -hmm. as Solo did. Okay? And both those movies are getting another X-Men movie sequel. Yeah. Like, underperforming is still performing. Yeah. A flop is John Carter of Mars. Exactly. Okay? A flop is when you're not even close to halfway. Okay? That and, is and a true flop. Exactly. A flop is not when they're halfway through building a billion dollar theme park. Yeah. Around this thing, there's a reason they want him to work and, as a young Han Solo. Yeah, and the thing is, is that for me, what what just annoys me is there, you know, this. I mean, this is just the cycle of news in general, but especially now on the internet, this vocal minority of bitter fucking jackasses gets to claim mm -hmm. and whoop victory. These are the Ghostbusters. Somehow they have managed to do something to hurt this movie. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I will give them this. Perhaps on a very small, tiny scale, mm -hmm. they made an impact. But it is nowhere near what they think no, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so... And like and, and, and here, too... It's a chink in the armor. It is. It's such a tiny chink in the armor. And... Because when, if you... Because in reality, in a month and a half, you're gonna buy whatever fucking Star Wars thing you want, or whatever. The and fuck. and also just it's you're just gonna keep on in spending. Order, no, you're no, never order, and stop. in order for them to gloat that they have somehow mag magically succeeded in destroying the Star Wars franchise, they have to ignore every other mitigating factor, which is one. This is Memorial Day weekend. Movies never do that well on Memorial mm -hmm. Day weekend. People are out at the beach. They're not going weekend. to the movies. It's a hard weekend. Two. That's why. That's why Disney put Star Wars in the summer. Exactly. Because they knew. Two. This movie had way less time I mean, to be winters. advertised Sorry. than any other fucking Star Wars movie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Three. Yet, honestly, the truth of the matter is, it's a prequel. Prequels don't always do. They really Make don't as much do money. as much especially money. Especially because, especially when it's the prequel sequel. Because it's literally... A prequel sequel. A prequel to... A sequel. To a prequel to a exactly. sequel. Like, exactly. And this is the most confusing explanation yeah. to have to explain to people that this movie takes place before Rogue One, yeah. but after the prequels, but before 1977. Yeah. Like, this it is, is confusing. It's work. <laughs> and, my thing, and, the, and the thing about it is, is that, honestly, yes, I'm not a four or five, whichever number I was on, the truth of the matter is, is that I think, you know, like, People, Solo is not the movie, Star Wars movie, mm -hmm. the major, the whole world is going to be super excited to go see. But it is what it is, but enough people but are going to be watching people are going to see it, and exactly. people are going to watch it for a good, yeah. large chunk of this summer. Yeah. 
over and over. And my thing about it's it is... It's going to keep on making money week in and week out. And my thing about it is this. And even if it doesn't, it'll make money when DVDs come out. Uh, it'll make money when people see it on TV. And my thing about it is this also. Is that this movie has good word of... It has good word of mouth. I have not... like Unlike The Last Jedi... Where people walked out of, or the vocal minority, I'm sorry, not everybody, but the vocal minority walked out of like, how could Luke? How could Luke? Yeah, like, blah, 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 blah. like the, everyone I've, a lot of people I've seen have walked out of Solo going, man, I thought that was gonna suck ass. Yeah. And I actually enjoyed myself. Everyone had their expectations lowered, and everyone seems like they were surprised with how much they enjoyed the results. Even this guy on the EU podcast, I was on Michael. His original reaction video was like so like disgusted by the movie, and then two three days later he's saying that he realizes he just you know he had a reaction to seeing Darth Maul pop up, yeah, and that was the last thing that stayed in his head when he was walking out of the theater. Mm -hmm. But the other ninety eight percent of the movie, he was having a great time, enjoying himself and happy with what he was seeing on this screen. This is what um Danielle Jose older. Um, tweeted today, May 30th, because um, there was an opinion piece in the Washington Post about Star Wars is faltering because it's obsessed with something about my, whatever. And he wrote, have yet to read a convincing explanation as to how a single movie, which debuted at number one. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. Yeah. It debuted at number one. Yeah. A flop doesn't debut at number one, guys. No. Even while coming in way below expectations. And it killed Deadpool 2. Deadpool 2 dropped 77%. 77 That's so ridiculous. Even while coming in way below expectations means that one of the most successful series in history is faltering. This feels like such a reach. And it's not like it was only big in the long ago past. TFA destroyed box office records, and TLJ wasn't far behind. Further, the Ryan Johnson trilogy and Favreau show and Resistance are set post-Return of the Jedi, not the distant past. I mean, like, come on, man, do your homework. None of this theory made any damn sense. One thing Star Wars is doing is having an ongoing conversation about the past and nostalgia. From Kylo's demand to destroy history to the First Order's neo-Confederate Empire obsession to Luke trying to correct Jedi failings. Like history, Star Wars rhymes but doesn't repeat. And then someone responded to him with a very astute observation, which is, it is the growth at all costs mindset from the tech and hedge fund mm -hmm. world infecting the arts and entertainment market. Mm -hmm. Even when you win, you can easily lose. And then he wrote, investor expectations are the worst two words ever to creep into this space. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Yeah. Um, Not everything you make is supposed to make more than the last thing you make. Mate, exactly. Sometimes you make something, and, you take and a risk, and you see how much you get out of it. Exactly. Or sometimes you shoot for a certain amount, and you make that amount. And if you make that amount, you cover, and that's it. And what's upsetting for me is that it is because there is this section of bitter faith. And that's what's so dangerous and upsetting about it is because we know there is this subsection of Star Wars fans. There is the famous saying, nobody hates Star Wars more than Star Wars fans. Mm -hmm. There's this section of negative people that claim they're fans of this franchise, and I don't know how, and they revel in the failings of the franchise because it's something that they didn't want. And that, and the problem with that is, is that when you're running around trying to tell people, how the fuck do people live in a people. world where a movie that made $1.3 billion is a failure? I know. How does that, but like, exist? These, these are just the people that were upset that Disney bought Lucasfilm to begin with. Yeah. Okay, and now that Disney, after having it for almost six years, has finally showed... A slightest bit of blood. Yeah. They're attacking it and leeching Sharks onto the it. fucking water, dude. Okay? And, and it's it's just, it's for me, and the, the thing about it is for me, and that's the thing, and that's why I, I want to talk about Solo just by itself as a movie, but I can't because Solo as a movie is has also been about... By this. Has been Has been, is also part of this whole thing. And, but I just, once again, I just don't understand how you can pray and pray and pray for more Star Wars. Then you get it. And Disney's like, look, we spent $4 billion on this motherfucker. We're going to make $16 billion, All right? This is what we're mm. going to do. We paid for this. We're getting return on investment. They're making content. This is finally what people have 
wanted. Content out of your ears. This is the dream, dude. The dream. When I was when I, bro, when when you'd go to Star Tours in MGM Studios, you would think they could do a whole Star Wars park if only they'd spend the money and figure it out and blah blah. They they're doing it. I'm an adult. And they're doing it now. They heard me then, I guess. Yeah, like, <laughs> and it, it's just it's for me, and and also too, it's just, I guess I am. Look, I'm not saying that people can't like it. I'm not saying that people can't dislike it and whatever. I don't have a problem with people disliking the direction or whatever. Because it is what it is. That's their subjective opinion and I can do nothing about it. I do have a problem when there feels like there's an active, vitriolic, you know, fucking section of what, quote unquote, this fandom. Because I'm using the term fan loosely. Mm -hmm. Who want to tear down everything about this simultaneously want to be possessive of it and yet also shit on it. I don't understand how you can do such a thing. When I see those girls walk out dressed as Jin Erso and fucking Ray, okay, on a Wednesday night, it's a school night, guys. Mm -hmm. Like, they're not, they have fucking school tomorrow. Mm. Like, they do. It might be summer. Oh, it's not summertime yet? Or it's in June. This is a summer movie. Some people, some people get off in the beginning of May. Some You're arguing semantics and, right now with me. I'm not trying to... It's just, this is a summer movie. Fine. The whole point of summer movie is kids can go to the movies all the time. Whenever they want. Okay, whatever. Well, we don't have kids. We don't know when kids are in We school. don't know. We don't have kids. We don't know. Whatever. It's Wednesday night. It's the weeknight. Okay, fine. It's a weeknight. It's weird to see a kid in Mr. a movie Semantic. on a weeknight. I feel you. Mr. Feel you. Semantics. It's a weeknight. These kids are dressed up as Ray and Jin Erso. That... The, I, I got emotional. It brought a tear to my eye. And I cannot stand that there is a section of this fandom that would look at those kids and go, mm, Ray and Mary They're not real Sue. fans. Ray and Mary Sue. Like, go take the longest walk off the shortest pier you can find, man. Like, it, and it, what sucks is because you can't, at this point, what's unfortunate about the toxicity in Star Wars fandom is you. it's so hard to differentiate people that dislike the direction and kind of want to have a constructive conversation about it versus these people that are misogynistic, racist, mm -hmm. and really destructive mm -hmm. in general to this and fandom. And you cannot determine the difference between them sometimes. Mm -hmm. You can't. You try. And that's, and that's but been the worst part about dealing with the fan fallout online this weekend. Yes. Is that this movie, since it had some plot lines that commented on, uh, you know, sexuality and uh, civil rights. Lando fucks robots. Lando f maybe fucks a robot. Probably or fucks At least a gets robot. a hand job or at least gives her a massage. Sucking, getting a way she likes. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Something happens. And also her a droid asking for droid rights, which was in A New Hope. Okay. That's, By the way, that's, yes. that's not That's not an accident that George Lucas grew up during civil rights times, and then decided to not let the droids have the same class, it's, it's just, the same status as humans at a bar. It's just okay? shocking. It's just shocking how... Did, it, it's amazing how these people have managed to take Star Wars and, divest, and mm -hmm. try to divest it from what Star Wars is. Mm -hmm. Star Wars was always a political commentary. About it was evil, always... Evil, white, homogenized people about fasc About fascist dictatorships. Diversity. About... It was about... Exactly. It was mm -hmm. about... I mean, like... And the worst part is that this weekend, you talk to people, and they got political to you about Star Wars being political. Yes. Okay. How dare you criticize something for injecting its politics into it, okay, that it always have by inserting your current bullshit alt-right crap anti-SJW politics. It's a shock. Okay? It's shocking. I thought it was just Ghostbusters dumbasses yeah. who were into horror movies too much. But it turns out it's also Star Wars fuckboys, no. okay? Because the fact that the assholes who tainted Ghostbusters so much that we couldn't get a Ghostbusters 2, they literally fucking cut out... They, they, there's a saying in Spanish 
that is basically translates to you're cutting out your eye to spite your face. You're cutting out your eyes to spite your face. Say it in Spanish, too. Huh? I don't know how to say it. My mom says it, like, oh, perfect. Damn. I'll get a clue of my mom saying yeah. it. And I'll add it to a podcast yeah. or whatever. But you're cutting out your own eyes to spite your own face. You're ruining your ability to enjoy the thing you love, okay? You purport Because to you can't even fathom how it could not be, be about you. what you think yeah. it should be, exactly. dude. You're robbing it of not only yourself, but of everyone ever in ex- that's going to come. You know what I mean? And like, you're stealing and, 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 it from and, and the future. Star Wars, and look, Star Wars, a lot of it is a Western idea, okay? It is Western ideas. But the po- it's still got universal themes of heroism that transcend western ideas okay like the hero's journey campbell didn't just study greek and roman myth and you know he studied all kinds of myth from all different parts of the world the hero's journey and the hero's myth is a universal idea so in that way it is not western in other ways it is kind of western because you you know like you know the idea of like defeating fascism and all those kinds of things that's a pretty western concept Mm -hmm. which is another reason why people think that it's never really been able to take off in china as much partly because they didn't grow up with it and partly because yeah it tends to have strong anti-government themes and you know i'm sure the chinese government isn't thrilled about that you know what i mean but like it's just yeah like it's it's still universal and so why shouldn't star wars as a universal idea, reflect the universal globe around it with people from different parts of the world, with people who look different, with women, with men, with all different kinds of characters. Like, what the fuck? That's the whole fucking point. And it's just, yeah, it gets really frustrating. And what's amazing is, it's really kind of ironically hilarious that Han, that Solo a Star Wars story is the most cookie cutter mm-hmm. of the more the recent Star Wars movies. It's the movie they should have enjoyed the most. Mm-hmm. And so to see them shitting on it and like going fuck this ha 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 Kathleen Kennedy you're going to get yours, I find y'all mm-hmm. hilarious. Because you guys would have eaten this shit if this mm-hmm. movie had come out Especially first. Especially eaten the shit before up. this movie there was a lot of stirring vitriol being aimed at Kathleen Kennedy still for being a woman in charge of stars. No, and but, if her no, name but, was Kevin Kennedy, believe me. No one me. would give a shit. But people have it out for Kathleen Kennedy. Absolutely. Because George picked her. Yeah. And because she has too smug a look on her face when she talks to you and talk like fuck you people. One last thing and then we'll put a pin in this podcast where apparently we did want to talk about the fuck boys. Well, I we, we just can't not the I fuck guess. boys have you know, you fuck boys, I'll be honest with Did you. Did you get to talk about your you favorite get, part of you Solo become... Star Wars story before we began this? No, no, we're going to do a Solo Star Wars story episode. Oh, shit. With uh, talking about the creative... The, the creative aspects. The, th- okay. the themes in that movie. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. I, I did oh, real... So, I've been podcast. following John Kasdan this week, because he's been hanging out about... He's been on fire. And he, uh, the, he's on this tweet thread, he goes, Sorry to have brought identity slash gender politics into... Dot, dot, dot. Nope, not sorry at all, because I think the galaxy George gave birth to in 77 is big enough for everyone. Straight, gay, black, white, brown, Twi'lek, Sulliston, Wookiee, Droid, and anything in between. Hashtag Droid Rights, hashtag we are sent you. Then some guy named at Ryan D. Cooper goes, People have thought so hard not to be denied, not to be defined by their sexuality. And then you go and do exactly that to Star Wars characters. Then John Kazan comes back with, respectfully disagree. Attraction sexuality has been a part of narrative not only since the beginning of film, see Murnau Sunrise, but the beginning of drama. Read, how do you say that? Aeschylus? 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 Oh, from the beginning of drama, read Aeschylus. Aeschylus. Aeschylus Shakespeare. She's so smart. (laughs) <laughs> to exclude the attraction from story is to exclude a basic human motivation. So, Kaboom. they in Disneyville, you guys are obsessed, and we'll talk about this more in our themes, 
But you guys are obsessed with what fake bullshit people wrote in books and referenced to make deadlines Mm -hmm. being referenced in movies. When these people are basing what they're writing off of classic literature and mythology and dramatic, uh, like, storytelling theory, okay? You guys are here trying to figure out... It's why, and I'm sorry, I must say it again, and I've said it before, it's why Raylos are able to figure out the movie... Before you did. Before you can. Because the Raylos are looking at it like a story. Are paying attention to the stories. They're looking at it a that's story, why they, not like a Star Wars. That's movie. why we guessed Raylo before anybody. That's why we looked at Raylo before anybody. Because we're looking at it as a story. We're seeing the tropes. Mm. We're seeing the, the thread lines, and it makes fucking sense. And plus, guess what? Who was right and who was wrong? It was not the Raylos. Plus, my favorite thing to throw at people's face whenever they doubt that. Kylo Ren and Rey should be together is the Star Wars celebration poster of Kylo Ren and Rey where Kylo Ren is holding Rey like he's on the cover of a romance novel and she's just draped oh my God, that so beautifully cover, and yeah. carefully yeah. as and they're standing like under that a was, falcon or that something. That was the first like come offic- on. That was the first official Star Wars celebration artwork with Rey and Kylo Ren in it together. Okay? And it was legit a, a romance, romance novel, novel cover. cover like her her back is arched more and he's got like this more like and she's got like a butt like she's all like arched and draped on him like in an erotic manner like like it doesn't look like she it doesn't look like he knocked her out. it looks like she's just like so overwhelmed with sexual emotion that she's like oh kylo i can't even do this right now and he's chewy doesn't like how we're sexualizing his uh Chewie can his suck it. Daughter. Chewie can and suck his daughter. And his nephew. Chewie can suck it because they're sexualizing each other. And I'm sorry, important plot point of Solo, we found out there's a king size motherfucking bed in the fucking Millennium Falcon. Alright? That's what we found out. That's Chewbacca's bed. And a sex closet. That's Chewbacca's bed now. And a sex closet. Chewbacca's tall. He needs a king size bed. Yeah, and a sex closet. I have been your host, Steven. And I have been Raylo Johnson. No, I'm kidding. Danielle <laughs> Raylo Danielle Cohortress of the Thirst Order um, Duke Xena Morty Rusty finally asleep after so much chaos we will do another podcast Thank where we you. talk about the creative part of Solo Chewy Baca for yeah. all your help <laughs> listen up for me and Danny coming soon we're gonna talk more Solo <laughs> thanks Chewy Wundercast? Give yeah. it up for Wundercast, man. What an adorable name.